All right, thanks for tuning in. You are listening to Gaucho Amigos. I'm Alex. I have two chats to share on today's episode. Uh, it's a two for one. I talked to Scott Hull. He's a mastering engineer. Uh, he's worked with tons of notable musicians, including Bruce Springsteen and uh, John Mayer. Uh, and he was the mastering engineer on Two Against Nature. Uh, he also worked with Donald on Kamikiriad. You know, I've talked to a lot of the sound guys from the earlier days of Dan, uh, like Bill Schnee and Elliot Shiner uh, and Dinky Dawson. So I did want to check in with someone from the more recent era uh, of Steely Dan. So thanks to Scott for hopping on Zoom to share his thoughts on collaborating uh, with Donald and Walter. But before I share my interview with Scott, uh, I also chatted a bit with Robin Flans. She is a Jeff Percaro expert. The late great drummer Jeff Porcaro, one of the most beloved and uh, respected session drummers of the 70s and 80s, who tragically passed away in 1992. Uh, Robin has written not one but two books on Jeff. Uh, one is called It's About Time, and uh, then a follow-up called Moments in Time. I uh, highly recommend both of those if you want to take a deep dive on the legacy of Jeff Porcaro. Uh, and Robin joined me briefly to talk uh, specifically about Jeff's uh, tenure working with Steely Dan. Uh, I'll play that interview and then I'll play uh, my talk with Scott immediately after that. Uh, so without further ado, here's Robin Flans. Enjoy. I think he was about 19. I mean, he was already playing for Sonny and Cher at 17. So he left that gig for Steely Dan, um, understandably. And um, I mean, that was his dream gig. So uh, yeah, he was about 19, I think, when he hit Steely Dan and took off like an airplane yeah and he got connected to them i believe it was when they were uh doing pretzel logic right yes so yes. at that at that point they only even had two albums and it was still already his his dream gig oh yeah oh no he was this was they were listening page tells me uh, david page tells me that they were listening to Steely Dan in the hotel room in Las Vegas when they were playing with Sonny and Cher. That's all they listened to was Steely Dan. And when, I mean, they were talking about, oh, we're gonna have a band one day. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna have our own band. And as soon as, you know, Steely Dan asked him to go on the road, it was like, bye bye. I mean, that was after Boz. He went on the road. Right. It was like, bye. See ya. So they were fans of Steely Dan when they were playing with Sonny and Cher, and then they ditched that gig to, to hook up with Steely Dan. That was like something. Do you, do you know um, how it went down? Like, how did they get connected? Was it like, did Donald call him, or, you know, how did it all happen? No, they were. Um, well, Jeff was playing at Dante's. And it's funny, all those years, <laughs> Jeff kind of fibbed. He, the story he told was that Donald and Walter walked into Dante's one night and saw him. That's not how it happened. Um, <laughs> only did I find that out after Jeff left us. But the real story is that um, Denny Diaz was told to go to Dante's and check this young drummer out. And Denny was blown away. Now, you know, Denny was the guitar player for Steely Dan. So he took Jeff's number and said, you know, you're really good guy, you know, you're gonna go places. And it wasn't until a year later that they were working on um, 
they were working on pretzel logic at the Rob's studio Cherokee in Chatsworth. And they were having trouble with this track night by night. And it was late. It was like 1230 at night or something. And Denny says, well, apparently they were having trouble with the drum track. Denny right. says, I know this guy. I think he could really do it. Nobody knew from this guy, Jeff Picaro. Because he was like a kid was, at this point, basically, right? Yeah. He was like 18, yeah. 19. <laughs> yeah. Nobody had heard of him. Right. But everyone was open to it. And they said, well, if you think he's good, you know, why the hell not? Call him. So they called him. Well, Denny called him. So Jeff, like always, <laughs> brought his buddy David Page. They show up. It's like 1230 at night. And um, and sure enough, Jeff saves the day. Fagan, I now I asked Fagan about it in my first book. And Fagan said, because I, you know, I had heard this cuckoo story that all these years with Jeff, he told a white lie that it had been Fagan and Becker who had seen him at Dante's. Right. So I wanted to get a backup here. I wanted to confirm Denny's story. Who really discovered did. Jeff Ricaro? Yes. And Fagan confirmed it was Denny. It was Denny. Yeah. And and so um, I said to Fagan, did you, how did you feel about some unknown being called into a session? I mean, wasn't that kind of weird? And Fagan said, you know, th those were early days and we were really open to trying out new guys. So it it seemed like it was a good idea at the time and boy we were really glad that happened it's a vegas lie said the queen of spain but don't tell it to a poor man because he's got to kill for every thrill the best he can everywhere around me i see jealousy and mayhem didn't know certain things and I feel so stupid because my interviews with him were so freaking lacking <laughs> and I'm angry at him for not telling me stuff like God uh, his idol was Jim Gordon do you understand that his idol was Jim Gordon. So he played and with he, on Pretzel Logic. And he played with him on Pretzel Logic. And he never talked about it with me. And I'm so mad at him. I'm so mad at him. But you've been able to piece together a lot of the the kind of uh, the history and the you know the lore of Procaro through all these other interviews that you've done over the years with other people, right? You've kind of yes backtracked. I Obviously, mean, it's not the same as you know. No. <sighs> well, it was only a short time that you know you had the chance to do it to do those interviews, right? Well, I interviewed him a lot. Yeah. But he didn't talk about stuff. I mean, he didn't reveal things that I wished. I mean, I have a whole chapter in my second book on Jeff and double drums. I know this is getting off the Steely Dan 
No, it's fine. Topic. But I didn't know that he played double drums with so many people. I had no way of knowing. How could I know? Yep. He didn't tell me. Well, I, I, from what I've, you know, from what I've gathered talking to other kind of session guys, you know, they'd hop in for a few hours, they'd do a session, then they'd go to another one for a few hours. You know, they were just kind of working regular musicians. And, um, you know, some of those sessions in retrospect became the stuff of legend. But at the time, I don't think they necessarily knew that, you know, those few hours they spent in the studio and, you know, that, you know. But that would have been big stuff to Jeffrey. Yeah. And not only that, I mean, I mean, he played double drums with Tony Williams. Wow. Never told me. I, if I could slap him across the face today, I would. Fagan invited him over to the house and um, he gave him a bunch of Charlie Mingus albums to listen to. He said, take these home and listen to them for a couple of days before coming back to the studio. And Jeff did. So the drummer on that was Danny Richmond and he absorbed it and absorbed it and sort of channeled Richmond and his father, Joe Picaro. And um, they would sort of put um, your gold teeth too on hold while they would do the album, they would come back to it and they would do more songs and they would come back to it. And um, it was it was really a that one was really complicated, but they finally got it. I mean, all the band had trouble with it, even Chuck Rainey. It was it was a tough one. Um, the other song that's really epic is Black Friday. The story behind that is you have to know about Jeff Picaro. He was as as great as his time was. He was also punctual at every session. He was there two hours ahead of time to set up. So the session is called and there's no Jeff. Which is very unusual. I mean, never happens. Gary Katz is getting worried. Of course, those days there are no cell phones. They can't reach him. They don't know what's wrong. He could be dead. What, what happened to Jeffrey? So he comes in, he's an hour late. It, and Fagan is furious. Well, it turns out that Jeff had been at Cher's house the night before he had broken his thumb playing volleyball. So he's got a cast on his hand. Oh no. So they're running the track down and Jeff is getting more and more frustrated. He's playing with a cast. Yeah. And finally, about after, oh, I don't know, four or five takes, he gets so frustrated, he throws the sticks against the wall and he says, F this, get Purdy. So I guess Purdy was a known entity at yeah. that point. Sure. And he storms out of the studio and Fagan is in a lather. He's hysterical. Katz is trying to calm him down. You know, Fagan, he'll be back. 
don't worry, he'll be back. He'll walk around the block for a few minutes. He'll, he'll be back. I know Jeffrey. Sure enough, Jeffrey comes back in 20 minutes. He's walked around the block. He's cooled down. He sits down behind the drums and he plays Black Friday flawlessly with a cast on his hand. That track is done with Jeff Picaro and a cast on his hand. Really the final version that you hear? They didn't yeah. go back and re-record it later on? Wow. Yeah, in 20 minutes. I wonder if that affected his playing on the song at all. Or do you well, think he could just play it normally? Hear the version. It's yeah. pretty pretty damn good. It's great. It's great. Uh, uh, iconic drum uh, part. By the way, uh, quick question. How was uh, interviewing Donald? You know, I was really scared. <laughs> I didn't know what to think. Yeah. But at the end of the interview, I said to him, well, you're not at all what I thought it would be. <laughs> but it was great. He was super, super nice, super great. Um, what were your expectations? You thought he was going to be like more difficult? Well, I didn't know. Look, I had tried to get uh, to both Walter and Donald um, early on in the writing. The first book took me eight years to write wow. um, because of people not you know, being available and I'd stop writing the book and I would get frustrated and whatever. I didn't think it would be good enough. I had a lot of self doubt, um, but they had said, no, you know, we've talked about Jeff enough was the message I got from their management. But at the final hour, I mean, literally the final hour, um, my uh, publisher said he had a connection to Donald. And uh, I said, <laughs> yeah. And I was nervous as hell. And um, he came through like a champ and not only that, but he said we could use a, a, a quote on the back of the book. There you go. So it was, he was great. I mean, he loved Jeff. You know, obviously I know you, you said you had a friendship with Jeff and, um, but you know, having a friendship with someone is one thing, but then writing two books about them is another, you know, why do you think, like, why have you chosen to focus, you know, so much of your, your time on, and, you know, like what, what drives your, you know, desire to tell these stories and, and to kind of share the legacy of Jeff Porcaro? Well, if he were still here, I probably would not be writing books about him. Um, I, you know, so many of us have been just torn apart by his early departure. And um, that's one thing. But the other thing is I've interviewed drummers for 40 years, or I did for Modern Drummer. And at the top of my list of musicality is Jeff Beccaro. Nobody, I mean, I have other drummers that I love. I mean, I have a list that's this long, okay? I mean, Keltner and Levon Helm and Roger Hawkins. And I mean, there are great, great drummers, but nobody feels to me like Jeff does. He has a feel that is just bottomless. It's just, it it his fills and his just it takes you to the edge and then it takes you off the cliff and it's just he's it hits you right here and my fear is that after my son's generation they will not remember jeffrey and i want them to I, I want them to know him forever.
There's obviously a lot of editing, a lot of selection, and a lot of details happening at the console and after, uh, you know, at the multi-track, but the sounds and the vibe and the performance is just coming out of the instruments. Uh, those um, um, is um, well reported that Donald would, um, you know, would search high and low to find the right drummer for a particular song, trying multiple drummers on some songs until he found one that had the right feel. It wasn't like, okay, that's those sounds are pretty good. We'll go fix it in the workstation. We'll fix it, you know, from the multi-track or in the mix. It was like, yeah, it's just it's not. It doesn't work with the song. It's not doing what I want this part to do with the song. It really didn't matter how long it took. It didn't really matter how many drummers he had to have, had to um, have play the song or how many passes it was when it was right he moved on and uh, my few moments of few days of working with him in, in the mastering studio was kind of similar um, if he liked something he never he didn't think about it again he just moved on it, it was it was doing what he needed it to do and um uh, that's different than other other perfectionists that I've worked with. <laughs> they, How so? Uh, well, What's different about Donald's uh, type of perfectionist? Well, uh, because he was able to keep moving forward. Um, he rarely went back and changed his mind on the decision. He actually, it actually seemed to bother him a lot if he had to rethink something that he had already sorted out. Um, and it was it wasn't angry with anybody. It was just kind of like well, I, I thought I, I liked that yesterday. Why don't I like that today? It, it was those those sort of those sort of feelings. Um, but um, if he didn't like what was what was happening, he was very clear about it. Like nah, nah, that's that's not it. Try something else. My first uh, shoulder to shoulder with him was um, in the early '80s. Um, I was assisting Bob Ludwig at Master Disc. Um, uh, on I went 61st Street, and this uh, new thing was had just been introduced called the compact disc, and uh, the labels were in a hurry to get as much audio on compact discs and get as many compact disc titles released as possible. So this was probably I'd say 85, six, seven. Uh, I'm not entirely positive of the year, but uh, it was. Um, but uh, what was interesting about that stretch of about two weeks is we worked on, <laughs> Bob worked on um, every single Steely Dan title <laughs> at that, up to that point. He had just finished uh, Nightfly a few years, a couple years earlier, and um, his relationship with uh, with Donald was you know had existed for a number of years, and so when it came time to digitize all those um, <laughs> all those recordings. Um, they brought all the masters, analog and digital masters, to the session, and um, for s several weeks, all we did was um, repurpose Steel and titles. And then over the years, those all those masters and remasters were done again and again as technology improved and as uh, different collections were put together and uh, just yada yada. The audience probably knows about that maybe more than I do. Yeah, I mean, they get, you know, reissued and remastered and, you know, there's a super audio CD. I mean, as all these formats have evolved, you know, there's always, they always go back to kind of those original albums, you know, the first seven or plus the Nightfly. And now, you know, I think there's 15 yep. in total now. Um, but they never, you know, what they don't do is they never release kind of like a B-Sides collection or, you know, some bootlegs or, you know, live albums. They only did the one. So they're kind of hesitant to release material that they don't think is like the complete finished, you know, thought through work. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I can, I can hear, I can hear Donald's nose wrinkle <laughs> to the, at the, at the idea of, of putting, putting something out in public. That's not, that it, it doesn't, I, I wouldn't call I'm going to hesitate for a second here and not say perfect or perfection. Yeah. Um, but he's got his more, he's got his, his pass fail moment. And if it doesn't meet that, it's just ordinary music. <laughs> it's, it's not something he wants to, um, he wants to share. Now, you know, maybe later in his career, they'll go back and find all these tapes and someone else will be responsible for them. But, um, um, well, there he, are tons, uh, there are tons of unfinished songs, you know, from, yeah. 
the early days that have kind of leaked out over the years and are kind of floating around the internet, but they've never been given, you know, Donald's blessing. Like he doesn't want any of that stuff out there. Some of it is, you know, goes back to his time at the Brill building, you know, even before Steely Dan started. And then some of them are like outtakes from Asia and Gaucho. So there's all this material that, you know, all these songs that he wrote that even though they sound okay, you know, to someone like me, like I'm perfectly happy listening to it. Like they don't meet his standards. So like he doesn't want to officially release it. He doesn't want to acknowledge it. And in all likelihood, he doesn't even want that stuff to be on the internet, period. I would I would say that's probably accurate. Um, um, How do you feel I, about that? That kind of stance? Well, if I if I use my you know my my best uh, analysis uh, uh, when I'm listening to some of those bootlegs, I go like, okay, I can I can, I can hear the, the where the, I can hear the lineage. I can hear that this is of a similar thing. I can even point to one or two other songs that have real similar intros or a very similar melody or maybe a similar topic um but it doesn't but but none of them go like oh my gosh that's the sleeper hit right how did they bury that one uh, none of them feel have yet have, have felt like that to me um and i think yep. it's for me very personally it was like it was just it was a rehash of something he already did and so i i could totally understand why he wasn't excited about it now, uh, he very well could have gone back to those songs and made something new, better, interesting out of them by, by you know, doing more development work on them. But um, I don't think he was cursed with the, uh, what the <laughs> with a uh, writer's block. So it, it was just he was always writing as many songs as he needed. And, um, uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's good. I think it's a good, uh, uh, good way to look at life. I mean, just kind of keep moving forward. Not necessarily, well... I, almost every artist I've ever talked to kind of hates their early work. Some embrace it and go like, hey, check out how ridiculous this was. This was our demos, our first record. And, you know, they put it out because it's, there's some commercial interest in it. But um, um, well, Donald has I, gone I, as far to dismiss Can't Buy a Thrill, which to this day is their most popular album. <laughs> Yeah, because it's the first one, and you know he doesn't think it's as strong as like his later work. So I I was told parenthetically, um, not by Donald, but by someone uh, working on those early records that that he was really didn't like his vocals performance on those okay. early records. My poison's name. Well, here's the thing about Steely Dan music that I've found interesting over the years, is that because the mixes are general, because the arrangements are generally so sparse, the tiniest little change in EQ, now equalization is like tone controls, very specific, um, very accurate little tone controls. Um, as we make changes, say to the mid-range or to the upper mid-range readers don't have to know exactly what i'm talking about here but as we change the tone on a non staley dan record you hear things like oh it seems kind of brighter okay and now I, I i kind of feel the snare drum is a little crisper and things like that in donald's records um when you make eq changes it's almost like you're moving the level faders. It's almost like, wow, the guitar just got louder. <laughs> and um, I, I, oh, wait a second, the, the shakers now just got louder compared to the vocal. Um, the, everything was compartmentalized, car, compartmentalized so well that equal equalization tone controls had to be really carefully applied. I mean, this isn't not isn't just Donald. This is Bill Schnee's and this is Elliot Shiner's work. Um, really shining uh, as well, um, because in a um, in a record where there's a lot of audio glue, <laughs> a lot of a lot of um, extra sound that's mixing together to make a okay. Think of a think of a Rage Against the Machine or a, 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 a um, or a Nirvana record or yeah. um, 
uh, or a big band jazz record uh, with op- with mics open, room mics open. There's lots of other sound gluing the recording together. You can hear the solo saxophone, but there's a lot of other stuff around it. Um, uh, unlike that in the typical Steely Dan song, it's like you're looking um, through glass at the at the at the performers. A very 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 tiny amounts of equalization can. Um, can have a profound effect on the balances um, in the Staley Dan work. So we, um, in in many cases, and in most of the songs that I've worked on him, uh, with him, on our um, you know the changes that we make in mastering are are tiny. When you put the master up against the original mix, you can tell the difference. You can f- feels that it's been refined slightly and polished slightly, but it's 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 not um, appreciably different. Uh, I would be really excessively egotistical to say that, uh, you know, my uh, uh, quarter dB at at, at 2.5K and a half dB at 10K, like, made the record. You know, it would be ridiculous to make such a statement. But um, those little tweaks were um, something that Donald felt needed to be made um, and that the... um, uh, it's, in some cases, it was for continuity from song to song. So a, any one given song may sound great on its own, but when you put it next to another song um, on the album, it's like, hmm, okay, that one sounds a little soft now coming out of the previous one, and it's the the, the symbols are a little aren't quite as bright. Okay, so and that's one of the goals, one of the one of the ideals of mastering is to help the individual mixes done sometimes by different people certainly at different times um, and uh, sometimes spaced apart by many by many months if not years to bring those recordings into a similar kind of focus so that your ear isn't isn't unduly jarred from one song to the next um, the flow of the record is actually engineered into an album it, it doesn't happen automatically they booked a session to do a single edit on Cousin Dupree and uh, to my surprise Walter was in town and Walter came to the session with Donald and sat behind me it, it his music was difficult to edit um, more so than most music it sounds like it's metronomic it sounds like it's done with drum machines and grids but it is not uh, any drummer that tries to play a Steely Dan track will tell you that it's not. There's no grid. There's nothing that lines up specifically. So it was quite a challenge to find uh, a an 8-bar or a 16-bar or 32-bar phrase where we could take out the music and have it not sound like a really crappy edit. Um, you don't want to have cymbals that suddenly get cut off. You don't want to have a background vocal change right in the middle or a lead, uh, you know, a little... He he. Pay, imagine taking a, a, a fine art painting, right, and cutting it down, you know, like 18 inches over from the left hand side, cutting it vertically and then taking six inches out of the painting and cutting it vertically and then putting those two edges of the painting up together. That probably isn't going to look right. You know, because <laughs> because it was created to be a landscape from left to right and it had space and it had. Right. Uh, well, that's kind of like what editing uh, Steel and End music was about. It was always changing and evolving. And um, I would challenge even the, the, you know, the most seasoned listeners is to go back and and listen to these tracks top to bottom and follow one instrument through. You're going to go like, huh. That 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 sound that sound changed. It's no longer on the left. It's now kind of over on the right, and it's got this different tone. There's all of this craft welded into these songs that um, that um, um, uh, looks simple and it's really complex. Anyway, so the song was difficult to cut. That's just a side story. The point. <laughs> sorry, I was gonna make was we're almost done with the thing, and I'm playing back the outro for for them to approve. And Donald turns to Walter and he goes, huh, why didn't we put background vocals on this song? And wow. there was a you long, said that? There was, oh my God. there was a long pause and Walter smirks and he goes, what? Really? Go, well, let me, let me start the, let me fill in the rest of the story. We had already made the CD 
the CD masters had been shipped to the plant, and the plant was starting to replicate the record. We were working on the edit for the first radio single, which was going to be released, you know, in about a month, and then the CDs would be ready. Right, so the album was done. This was for the single. This we're working on the single. Everything had been signed off on, and I had made a whole stack of masters that had shipped to different plants around the world <laughs> to make the CDs from. And he goes, "Why didn't we put background vocals on this one?" And he goes, "I don't know. Why did we put?" Or he, say, he he answered back sort of like it was a knock knock joke. It was hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, Walter Walter said, "Oh, you're serious?" And it kind of asked me to play back the chorus, and he's saying out loud in the room kind of scratchily kind of has about a kiss from your cousin Nippery. the high harmony that you hear in that chorus it, it wasn't in the recording and uh and he goes are you thinking what i'm thinking <laughs> and donna goes i think we have to do it and Walter goes, <laughs> well Walter goes why not you know it, it it sounds like it should be in there and so you know, we finished, we stopped what we were doing. Uh, Don picked up the phone and called a couple people and the background vocalists were called and Roger Nichols was called and everybody converged the next day in his studio in Manhattan and they overdubbed vocals and some harmonies. There's some oohs and ahs in the chorus and there's a whole bunch of um, harmonies in the chorus in Cousin yeah. Dupree. Um, I... Uh, I I, I got to say I I wish I had in my possession a copy of the pre um, the uh, I I was so entirely respectful of of Donald and all his work and stuff I didn't even want to have a copy of something that wasn't um, even though I I would I'd cherish it at some point and show it to somebody and say look I'm a big shot I you know play this listen to this before they added the vocal. It just wouldn't be right. I wouldn't even if I had it. I wouldn't want to share it with people. It's not Don. It wasn't Donald's work. I feel like it, you know, as a professional, I'm trusted to um, to not do that kind of crap. Uh, yeah, uh, with, uh, with people's art. And but the story is hilarious because the whole machine stopped. We had to call the label. They had to stop making the CDs. Um, and then they had the session. They they couriered the part the the track back over to me. I inserted it into the master and then we ran all new production masters and sent them back out to the plant again and then redid the single edits because the background vocals, the background vocals needed to be on that edit as well. But uh, witnessing that whole thing, it just, it didn't, it didn't really mean a whole lot to them that it meant uh, uh, the release date was going to get, you know, bumped or that it was going to cost more money or anything. It's just, he goes, why, why aren't there background vocals on there? It's like, it's, <laughs> I, uh, I love the story. It's like, if anybody can make a, a an enormous, you know, a late in the game correction, um, and, and, and make it a hit. <laughs> I just, I just love uh, being able to witness that. And the other thing, if you let me go on, ramble on a little further, I had told you that Donald was kind of quiet and reserved and kind of highly focused on what he was doing, except when Walter was in the room with him. The two were cracking each other up, telling each other <laughs> stories. They were laughing. Don, I literally turned around at one point and like thought someone else had entered the room. I don't think I'd ever, I didn't think all through Comic Carriad and up to that point on Two Against Nature, I don't think I had heard Donald laugh except maybe a little... <laughs> you know, a little chuckle here or there. They were cracking each other up, telling each other stories that went completely over my head. I didn't have any idea what they were talking about. <laughs> but I was. it was so much fun. It was fun to see them having such a good time working together. Um, so but so it, with it, Walter, he was a very different person. I, from my observation, yes. they. He was enjoying the process in a, in a different way uh, than he was, um, in my opinion. Now, he may have been enjoying the process just the same way, but he outwardly, he seemed to really be enjoying his time with Walter. So that's that was my takeaway from that. I don't know whether I was reading a whole lot more into it or not. Uh, it was just, it. Don went from being kind of leaning over and kind of uncomfortable and almost a little bored <laughs> looking when he's working on his own to um, just enjoying the process um, uh, in a different sort of way, or at least enjoying the Com com camaraderie uh, of his uh, of his co-writer another question about two against nature so a couple of years ago they finally released it on vinyl and you were part of that process correct yes 
um, a kind of an interesting story. But yes, I, I um, was asked to cut it. Um, I've been, um, you know, like the first half of my mastering career was really, well, I learned vinyl cutting when I first joined MasterDisc because we weren't making CDs at the time. Through the years, as mastering changed and I got older, um, when I came back to MasterDisc in 2008, um, I took on more cutting, more disc cutting again. Um, there wasn't that much call for it, but the work that was coming was really, really high fi very in very purposeful but vinyl done done despite everyone's denial that you know well vinyl's old and it's not convenient and it's, you can't skip and it's you can't take it with you but uh, despite that a number of people were still making vinyl and and i just kept focusing on it more and more and more and more but yeah when the record came out they looked they reached out to me um uh, to confirm some of the, the final mastering and um, uh, did the original cut for the 33 version of um, Two Against Nature. And then um, I don't, I have lost track of time, you know, maybe a year or so went by. Um, and then I heard from um, Chad at Acoustic Sounds that the 40, that he had licensed the a 45 version of Two Against Nature. Um, but the call came to me in a different for a different reason. Um, the cutting studio that he usually uses for his work um, was having trouble making it sound, quote unquote, right. It was having they're having trouble with it. Um, what you know why? If you, um, I don't know specifically why, but I I have a couple. Of, Th thoughts and it goes really back to some of the early things I said about Staley Dan. The music is so transparent that it everything that you t do to it has some sort of impact on the music. Uh, this sounds kind of like well, of course that is what every all music does. But to be honest, a lot of other music you could run it through an analog console, you could run it through tubes, you could run it through solid state. It'll change a little bit, but it doesn't like completely ruin it you know it might move it a little bit in one direction might be a little warmer might be a little cleaner but with staley if you're not running through the simplest most direct path um you notice it right away um mm. so the the story goes something like they made several attempts to make the 45 rpm cut um uh, sound like my 33 rpm cut and uh the chat eventually gave up and and gave me the, the opportunity to cut it. Um, I, I say it that way because you know, his relationship with this other disc mastering studio is, is long and storied. Um, uh, uh, it was kind of like <laughs> Chad kept calling me and asking me if I knew why the 45 cut wouldn't be working, why it would sound so bad. And I was like, you know, dude, you could hire me. I'm, st <laughs> I'm here. I can cut it at 45. <laughs> I used the same signal path that I used to originally cut the 33. We adjusted the parameters um, for a 45 RPM cut, um, changed the levels accordingly. But I think more importantly, I knew what it was supposed to sound like. Um, and it, it, it had to sound like that. I couldn't change it. Um, I, I mean, couldn't change it. It was very easy to change it, but I should not change it. Um, changing it was uh, was um, uh, uh, was not the goal <laughs> and I think that uh, their other mastering house you know maybe has a different priority um, I'll let your listeners uh, do the do the look up and figure out who they who I'm talking about I don't I don't mean to um, put myself above or beneath or <laughs> beside anybody uh, I just know I'm just talking about my work so what are your personal uh, feelings about, you know, vinyl versus CD versus, you know, MP3 versus digital? You know, like, do you have a personal take on what sounds better? Do you have a preference? Um, I'm going to make a, uh, you know, cautiously answer that because it, um, uh, there is a really good call, really good purpose for both, if not all formats. Um, 
if I'm in the mood for vinyl, digital's not going to do it for me. And if I'm in the mood for, you know, convenient takeaway hi-fi listening experience and headphones or something, that, that you know, maybe vinyl's not going to do it for me. Um, I don't think I like, I don't like to say one's better than the other. I like to say you're going to get, if you're, if you listen carefully to your own psyche, your own, if you can monitor the way you feel as you're listening to the music, that will tell you which one's better. But I think we shouldn't say it's better or worse. It's better for you, maybe even better for you at that particular time. Um, it could be said that if you're in the mood to sit and chill and listen to an album side, glass of wine, armchair, dim the lights, nothing better than, than, uh, than vinyl for that and a really good playback system. Yeah. Um, um, and if you're consuming audio, you know, um, maybe in a, you know, in a more mobile or portable sort of way, or it's background music for you while you're working or getting chores done or um, meditating, um, and you want it to be the experience to not stop, so you want to be able to just keep on going to other songs, you know, maybe streaming, uh, you know, higher definition streaming is. The, I, I'm I'm going to refuse to answer it, but just say that um, okay. it's a person. <laughs> it's a personal decision, um, um, and I am firmly planted in both realms, so um, I don't dislike either of them. <laughs> so you don't want to <laughs> so take sides on this issue. I, I I I not only don't want to. I I I can't. I I have to. I have to work each format um, and each deliverable um, to the best as a as a fan of that format you know uh, every day for that artist that i'm working on working do you, with. do you think um two against nature sounds noticeably different on vinyl than it did on cd in your opinion because i i'll be honest i haven't heard the vinyl yet and i'm just kind of it's interesting because that album came out at a time when vinyl was not popular, you know, it was a big selling CD. It sounds yep. like an album made for the CD era. And then, you know, I hear, Oh, they're putting it on vinyl. And I'm like, that's really interesting because I can't think of what that particular album would sound like on vinyl and how it would be drastically different. I mean, like Asia, that's very much a vinyl album that came out in the seventies. It has that sort yeah. of analog warmth to it, you know, the, the way it was recorded and, the, you know, the way the sides are kind of laid out, like that makes sense to me as a vinyl album, but Two Against Nature doesn't quite feel that way to me. And I'm just kind of curious to hear how it would sound. Well, it's, it's different. Um, it's a decidedly different experience playing it back. Um, one, you know, the record's broken either into two sides or four sides, depending on the version you're listening to. So that alone changes, you know, and, you know, if, if you're anticipating, uh, you know, the next song right, because you've listened to it on the CD, you know, you have to get up and turn the record over to hear the next song. Um, so and the surface noise is uh, and occasional ticks and pops are managed really well uh, on the vinyl. It's a really nice sounding vinyl um, uh, in both cases. Uh, but um <laughs> It's really personal. I think some people have figured out that they actually really like that kind of nonlinear, uh, occasional, um, non-musically correlated noise. Um, I've, let me see if this makes any sense to your listeners. Okay. Well, to you and to ultimately to your listeners. Yeah. Um, ever been in a really quiet room and feel uncomfortable um, because <laughs> it's so quiet? And then if somebody just puts on the subtlest little noisemaker, uh, it's either an oscillating fan or an air conditioner or, you know, a, a refrigerator were or something, there's, it will generally cause you to be less uncomfortable. It may, it, you could say it's calming device. You could say it's whatever. I think that kind of non-correlated noise, um, it, 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 we're wired to, um, to hear it, but then tune it out. But you know, we're still interacting with it. It's it's in the room. It's part of the. It's part of our, you know our life. It's part of our experience. 
So I recognize it is like that. It, it doesn't go up and down with the music. It's totally not correlated with the music. It's it's random. Um, and yet our brain's pretty good at tuning it out if we listen to vinyl on a regular basis. Um, you know, it's obviously if it gets too noisy that it interrupts the, the experience of the music, you notice it. Um, same thing with the air conditioner. If it suddenly comes on, you know, with at a high speed, you're like, oh yeah, that thing's still on. But if it stayed at the, you know, a, a very constant, subtle background blur. So I think, <laughs> oh boy, this is going to be, this is a fun one. So my analogy is uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's analog. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because one of the biggest kind of criticisms of Steely Dan is that their music sounds almost too sterile and like you can't hear the room. And I think that makes people uncomfortable. So that's, you know, do you see where I'm going? I do. I do. And there, there's. So your analogy is apropos, but kind of going in the other direction. <laughs> it's like, let's mess it up a little bit and make it a little, anal a little more analog sounding. And right. um, it, it, it appeals to us, a, 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 you know, a, um, a different, a, a, it, it maybe appeals to a different person um, a little more that way. This, this stuff is subtle. I really don't like this. The, um, um, I, I, well, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but I, I don't think it's a great place to be to be telling you know people you know you're a fool to be to you, you you know vinyl sucks it's it's noisy it's distorted it gets scratched and all these things when a, a lot of people really enjoy the process and and have come back to enjoying music specifically because vinyl gives them a different kind of listening experience and there's a pleasure to it there's a collectible aspect of it there's a graphic and, and visual aspect of it um so um i'm i'm for doing the best possible masters i can make in in both formats or in all future formats um to um you know the uh, um um you know whether it's multi-channel or whether it's uh, um, virtual um, VR uh, kind of things. Um, it's they all have they all has of a potential application. The personally, um, I I I'm not particularly compelled into the multi-channels of formats for most generally for music um, because we've spent our whole lives looking forward at concerts and watching bands you know from the audience. Right. Um, uh, it's it may take generations of of music fans, or maybe a couple generations of music fans, to sort of break that habit and start thinking about music in a in a surrounding us kind of way. Um, I, I'm getting a little existential with with my opinions there. No, no. It, but that's, I haven't heard too many repurposings of stereo music into a into a multi-channel environment that you know, made me want to run out and buy a whole bunch of speakers and place them around my rooms. And a yeah, lot of your I feel the exact same way. I yeah, feel the same I, way. I, I imagine the hi-fi listeners and your readers and listeners in your group, you know, are kind of, you know, in that same well. But at the same time, if it was uh, uh, an immersive um, an entertainment experience, uh, an altered, uh, you know, an um, enhanced reality thing where, you know, you're, your the people around you the, your your audio that you're hearing enhances that what you're actually seeing or it's completely virtual or if it's a gaming experience or something like that that's a completely different story and the multi-channel you know surrounding you know experiences aren't you know aren't born of the you know the rock band on stage or the orchestra on stage um paradigm which is you know how we think about how we've always thought about music. Mm -hmm.